perhaps no other character in scripture suffered from fear and depression and anxiety more than David did in the Old Testament. David fought a lot of battles during his life. But it's his defeat over the giant Goliath that we all remember most. Now, in, in Israel today, there's a place, and the, it's these two huge hills, and there's this valley with a ravine uh, running through it. And it's believed that this was the site of the battle. Well, on one hill was the army of Israel. On the other hill were the Philistines. And down in the valley, between them was a plain of about 100 yards. Imagine a football field. And uh, that is where... David confronted Goliath. Now, the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, for those of you who are, who are wondering where it's at in the scripture, uh, it's not just a story about a boy fighting a giant. It's a reflection of the conflict of the ages. It's a reflection of that classic battle between good and evil. The challenge between the forces of the devil trying to trump uh, the living God and his purposes. And today we're going to take a fresh look at this story. I know it's a very well-known story, but we're going to see it from a different perspective. And we're going to learn from David uh, how to find strength and courage to overcome the giants in our lives. If you've ever gone through anxiety, hopelessness, despair, things like these, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. You feel like these things outmatch you. You think that there's no way that you're ever going to overcome when you're in your darkest moments, you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so you begin to wonder, am I ever going to make it out? Is there ever going to be a breakthrough for my life? Now, the answer is yes. That's the easy answer. But I'm going to tell you how to get there according to Scripture and according specifically to the life of David. Uh, I've, I've titled uh, this message, How to Fight Giants. I want you to turn to somebody and tell them it's time to, to fight some giants. Amen? It's time to fight some giants. Your giant may be worry. It may be anxiety. It may be despair, sorrow. Maybe the loss of a loved one has thrown you into a depression. Could be hopelessness or anxiety. But I want us to begin this morning looking at how David and Goliath got to the battle. And I want us to begin with Goliath. Somebody shout Goliath. The Bible calls Goliath the champion of the Philistines. And tells us that he came from a city called Gath. Gath was a well-known Old Testament city. I'll take you back uh, a few uh, books in the Bible. If you'll remember that, that famous story of Moses sending out 12 spies right before the people of Israel are about to make it into the promised land, and the people are doubting, and so God says, hey, send 12 of your best men to explore the land and come back with a report for the people. Out of those 12, if you remember the story, 10 of them came with disbelief and a negative report. Two of them, only Joshua and Caleb, believed that God would actually fulfill his promise. And the ten that came with that spirit of unbelief referenced the city of Gath in their report. They said, hey, we saw in the city of Gath some men that are like giants, and we seemed like grasshoppers to them. And the Bible says now in 1 Samuel 17 that Goliath was from this very city, from Gath. So he was... Probably the giant of all giants. In perhaps the most descriptive narrative of any man found in scripture, we find in 1 Samuel 17, verses 4 to 7, then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. This is just his armor. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Now, this is quite the intimidating description, much like many of us would describe our own adversaries. They're intimidating they inject fear into us. And during a time when the average man's height was about five feet tall, can you imagine Goliath at about, scholars say specifically between nine foot six and nine foot nine. 
So imagine a, a five-foot average Israeli guy or Jewish guy going up against a guy that's almost twice, literally. I know we see tall people like, man, he's twice my size. No, but this guy literally was twice the height, nine foot six to nine foot nine. And he wasn't scrawny. It wasn't like he was tall and skinny, all right? When you take into account that his body armor weighed 125 pounds, scholars put him somewhere between 400 to 500 pounds. And so 400 to 500 pounds in our day is not healthy. But when you're 9 foot 9, 400 to 500 pounds is very healthy, okay? It's, this is like a big, you know, big muscle mass there in Goliath. So is it any wonder why no Israelite would want to come forward and face Goliath? To make matters worse, Goliath did not offer a one-time threat. And here's where you begin to see some parallels. We already saw it when you feel outmatched, when you feel overcome. But here's another parallel between what you might be going through and what Goliath represents. It wasn't a one-time threat. It wasn't like Goliath came out one day with one set of choice words. The Bible says that for over six weeks, or around six weeks, he came every day, twice a day. Doesn't that reflect some of these things that steal our sleep? Like we have to fight them on a daily basis. Sometimes on multiple occasions, occasions each day. So imagine this. 1 Samuel 17 verse 16. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. Imagine this monster among men shouting down your confidence multiple times a day. Let's read verses 8 to 11. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Isn't that how some of these sleep stealers leave us? Terrified and deeply shaken. Now I want you to see something. He's, this is one man from the Philistine army, probably, or you know, it's safe to say this was their best warrior, their best man. And he's trying to entice somebody from the Israelite army to come and face him. Now this type of single combat was very, very common practice in the Old Testament. Armies at the time preferred to settle their fights economically. Like rather than killing like hundreds or thousands of people, rather than putting the lives of many at stake, what they would do is each side would send their best soldier to fight. And there was this agreement. It was like an unwritten rule. These two best men from each army would fight, and they would fight unto the death, and the winner's nation was declared victorious. The loser's nation was enslaved or brutalized and sometimes worse. And so this parallel lines up with something powerful that my wife said last week. Your battle today has generational implications. The enemy is after you and your family. He's after you and the people around you. He has singled you out for single combat, but don't get it twisted. What you do today, what you decide today will affect many people around you tomorrow. In fact, the generations that are to come, your descendants will be affected by the decisions that you take today, that decision to take up courage and face the giants in your life and win the battle in Jesus' name. Come on, church. The giants you overcome today, your kids may never have to face tomorrow. That's a good motivator. There's a lot of things that I do, and I, and I realize God has put me as a father figure, as a pioneer for my family from this day forward. And there's a lot of things that I do motivated by this truth. That the very things that are trying to shake my faith today are going to solidify the faith of my kids tomorrow. And so I'm going to stand strong. I'm going to be brave. I might not have the energy. I might not have the will. But in Jesus' name, I'm going to find it. I'm going to rise up. I'm not giving up. I'm pressing on. Now let's talk about David. Somebody shout David. David wasn't expecting to fight on this day. But he was ready. 
He wasn't expecting it, but he was ready. He was there to deliver food for his brothers and to check on them and then bring back a report to his dad back home. But when he witnessed the threats of Goliath and saw that no one was responding, he volunteered. You see, nobody believed. Nobody believed. When David said, I'll fight him, some of them jeered, others laughed in disbelief, but slowly their disbelief began to turn into anger. His brothers tried to talk him out of it. What are, you, what are you even doing here? Go back home. You just came to see the spectacle. And David's like, you know, in, in his heart, and this is not in the Bible. This is my own version of it. I imagine David in his heart is like, man, you're not doing anything about it. Why are you criticizing me? I'm just trying to show up and do something. I'm trying to do the very thing that you won't do. And you're the soldiers. And you're the ones that are trained. And you're the ones that are equipped. I'm a shepherd. And they were trying to hold him down. They tried to talk him out of it. The king tried to talk the boy out of it. I mean, this is your leader. This is the guy that's supposed to put the wind under your wings. But no, he's clipping them. He's saying, you could never do it. Speaking of King Saul, the Bible says that King Saul stood head and shoulders above all of the men of Israel. So he was the tallest guy in the army. He should have been the one, and he was their leader. He should have been the one to step up to the plate and say, hey, I am going to fight this giant. But not even he was willing. If you're facing one of these sleep stealers that we're talking about in our series, know full well that God brings people to the battleground that he knows are equipped. How does he know? Because he deposited in you the very potential that you need to overcome. We talked about this last week. He will never allow you to go through something that you cannot withstand. He won't give you a burden that you cannot carry. And so if you're in the battle of your life, understand that God holds you in high esteem. You wouldn't be in it if you couldn't get through it. I'm going to say that again. You wouldn't be in it if you couldn't get through it. The only reason why you're in it is because God knows that he is on your side, that you're going to make it through, that there's a purpose to your process, and you're going to make it to the promise. Can somebody shout amen if you receive that this morning? There are five lessons to be learned about overcoming your giants in this famous story, and this is what I want to share for those of you who are note takers. Number one, refuse to be discouraged. Refuse to be discouraged. Now... It's, it's been often said that we can't control our emotions, but we can control how we react to our emotions. We need to decide once and for all, as children of God, are we going to allow our emotions to lead us or are we going to lead our emotions? The Bible speaks about the fruit of the Spirit, one of them being self-control, which means that through the Spirit, you have the power to say, yeah, I don't feel like getting up this morning, but you're going to get up. Yeah, I don't feel like raising my hands in worship, but hands, you're going to raise up. Amen. You have the power within you, given to you by the Spirit of God, to react in a positive way, even to negative emotions. And sometimes you got to encourage yourself in the Lord, as David used to do, and refuse to be discouraged. But the sad fact is that we can't always count on the people we expect support from. Look at 1 Samuel 17, verse 28. When David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. These are his brothers. Verse 33, this is the king. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. You know when somebody tells you don't be ridiculous, they're actually calling you ridiculous? <laughs> There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. I think we all have that uh, brother or that uncle or that friend or that family member or some other relative or somebody that we know that always undermines your efforts. And whenever you determine a goal, they'll say things like, oh, so you want to finish college, eh? So you think you're all that, huh? It's like, you're going to be the first one in the family to finish, to finish you know, college. And you're like, it's not, it's not that I think I'm all that. It's just that I refuse to think that I'm nothing. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. You're supposed to be encouraging me. 
I know God's called me for a purpose, and so I'm after it. But some people will envy you for your purpose, for your goals, for your determination, because they lack it. Some people are never willing to confront their fears. And so they lash out at you enviously because you dare to believe that the greatest conquests are on the other side of your fears. What's more is that when a man or a woman of God decides to be a champion for God, you got to understand this, you will get heat, you will get criticism. And it can be very discouraging to get it from your own family and friends. And so on that note, I just want to give you a few pointers. Um, when somebody's going through anxiety, for example, be very careful how you speak to them and the things that you say. I remember when my, my, my wife was going through her, her, her process, you know, and she would reach out to people trying to find an encouraging word, just trying to find uh, something to uplift her. And, you know, she would share her struggle with somebody and they'd be like, well, be, be careful, Pastor. Be careful because, you know, my... my my, you know, I have a cousin that he, he went through that and like, you know, I'm going to make this up because I don't want to put anybody on blast. So I'm going to make up the scenario, right? But they'd say something like, something like really discouraging. They'd say something like, you know, be careful because, you know, he, he, was, he was depressed too. And one day he just didn't wake up and, you know, they did the autopsy and there was worms in his brain. And, um, and uh, you know, and it's like that, that's not what I need to hear in that moment. You know, a, 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 a simple, hey, God is with you. A simple, hey, you're not alone. A simple, hey, you're going to make it through this. This too will pass. We'll do, church. Amen. When you, when you uh, confront people, and, and I'm, I'm not you know, pointing out anybody because we lived through this. I remember when we got married, my wife and I, we couldn't have children. For seven years, we didn't have children. And I remember that uh, everybody would come, and they'd be like, well, what, what's wrong with you guys? But first of all, if a couple can't have children, don't assume that it's that they don't want to. Right? And they'd be like, what's wrong with you guys? How come you all never had children? And we want to carry your baby. And like, you, want to, you want to pay for the diapers too? Um, and that was just my way of, you know, deviating from, from the, the core issue. And, and sometimes people are going through things that, that are so discouraging for them. And what they're looking for is just a shoulder to cry on, an ear to listen. They're looking for somebody to just say something positive. We were at a leadership conference and... And uh, this past weekend, and uh, one of the statistics that blew my mind is that a kid in high school, for example, by the time a kid gets to high school, he has heard over 100,000 negative comments compared to about 5,000 positive affirmations. That's a crazy ratio. As the people of God, we need to be more positive than that. And it's not just good thoughts, it's God thoughts. It's not just positive thinking, it's standing on the promises of God. And when people come to you discouraged, you need to be a source of strength. You need to be a source of encouragement. You need to be a lifter. You need to be an encourager. Don't be a dream killer. Don't be, you know, another thing that we have, especially in our, our Latino culture, is that we, uh, we're all doctors. Have you noticed that? You know, like, oh, you can't have children or you ought to eat this. <laughs> like, Really? And you know this how? What's your level of education again? Third grade? Okay. Uh, yeah. But we need to be encouragers, church. We need to, instead of offering solutions, I know when I go to somebody, it, it, by the time I go to somebody, 95% of the time, I already know the solution. I just need somebody to encourage me to get there. I know that's true for you too. Sometimes you just need to hear affirmation and say, hey, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. Someone should have told David, yes, you can do it. Yeah, I know, David, it seems impossible, but that's what they said about the Red Sea. Remember when Moses was standing in front of it and they had nowhere to go because Pharaoh was chasing them? It was impossible, but God opened the Red Sea. Somebody should have told David, hey, David, you're, this giant's going to come down. Remember Jericho? There was no way the people of God could overcome the city. But they marched around it. They believed in God. They praised the Lord. They obeyed. And the walls came tumbling down. If God did it before, he'll do it again. This giant is falling down too. 
Come to think of it, I think David had a harder time with his support system than he did with the giant that was coming against him. Some of the biggest obstacles we face in life are the people around us. By the time we get to the battle, we're equipped. God is with us. But it's trying to overcome the discouragement from people around us. That is so difficult. Don't be that person. You can throw rocks at your giants. And it's difficult because, you know, when people are discouraged, you can throw rocks at your giants. But you can't throw rocks at your family and friends. Maybe your mother-in-law. But other than that, you can't throw rocks at them. You know? Number two. Reinforce your focus on God. Turn to someone and tell them, focus. Tell them, focus on the right thing. Focus on God. 1 Samuel 17, verses 24 to 26. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, I love this because they're having this conversation and they're saying, hey, you know what the king said, right? They're saying, whoever kills this guy, the, the king's going to give him great wealth. The king's going to give him his daughter in marriage. And he will exempt the family from taxes. And then David, we just read David, I said, come again. What, what did you say they're going to give to the man that defeats this giant? They said, the king's going to give him great wealth. Okay, that sounds good. The king's going to give him his daughter in marriage. That sounds good. And your family's not going to have to pay taxes. I, I don't know how good looking the king's daughter was, but I know how much I pay in taxes. And taxes would have been good for me. I would have been like, I'm in soul. And so David accepts this challenge. But in reality, he wasn't focusing on that, we're going to see in a minute what he was really focusing on. But focusing on the right thing on, and having the proper perspective is perhaps 85, 90% of the battle. David didn't see what everyone else saw. Everyone else saw an invincible giant. David saw an opportunity. In the literal sense, they were seeing the same thing. It was the same mass of flesh. It was the same giant that they were all seeing. But the perspective was starkly different. The Philistines responded with fear. David responded with intrigue. He was like, hmm, that sounds, that sounds enticing. I like no taxes. I like the king's daughter. I like great wealth. He was looking at the opportunities behind the challenge. And that's the problem that I have with a lot of Christians. Because a lot of us, when the enemy comes, when the giants rise up, we complain about our situation when we should be asking questions. We assume too much. And don't ask enough questions. Oh, this giant rose up against me. I mean, Satan must be out to kill me. The, the, the Lord must have, must have uh, abandoned me. And we start making conclusions. Don't make conclusions. Ask questions. Turn to someone and tell them, ask questions. What am I going to get if I defeat this giant? Who is this king? And what is this king going to do to the man that honors him? How is my faith going to grow from this? How are my efforts going to pay off? How are my children going to reap the benefits? What is God preparing for me? That is what you need to be asking. Those kinds of questions. Like David. Don't focus just on the adversity before you. Focus on the possibilities. After overcoming that adversity. Be imaginative. Dare to believe that God has a great plan for your life, despite the adversary. The difference between David and his brothers and Saul was that they had been studying the giant for six weeks. They knew everything about him. They were focused on Goliath. And David, by contrast, made only two observations about Goliath. Now, I'm not going to take you there. I'm not going to point them out. But read the narrative, 1 Samuel 17. Only two times does David mention Goliath, one in verse 36, comparing him to the animals that David had already defeated as a shepherd. He's like, I've defeated lions and bears. I can defeat Goliath too. 
And the other in verse 26, when he mentions that the giant was pagan, or uh, some versions that are a little bit more explicit say that he was uncircumcised. He didn't ask any questions about Goliath's experience. He didn't ask any questions about his skill, his age, or his IQ. No questions about the weight of the spear or the size of his shield. He only makes two references to Goliath. Somebody shout two. But he gives much thought to God. Look at verses 45 to 47. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. In the entire narrative, David referenced the Lord nine times. How many times? How many times did he reference Goliath? Twice. So God's thoughts, or God thoughts, outnumbered Goliath's thoughts nine to two. How does this ratio compare to yours? Do you ponder on God's power four times as much as you ponder your weakness? Do you ponder God's promises four times more than you ponder Satan's lies? You see, it's okay to talk to God about your problems, but sometimes you got to talk to your problems about your God. Prophesy and proclaim victory in the face of your giants. Imagine yourself victorious and what that would mean and how that would feel. Sometimes you have to not, I used to say fake it till you make it, but sometimes you got to faith it till you make it. And focus on God. Focus on God. Nine to two. That's a good ratio to have. Yes, problems are going to confront you. But for every problem, make sure you think about four promises of God. Make sure you combat that. And can I tell you, can I tell you something? You are not alone. The Bible says we have the angels of God who are ministering spirits to us. This, this wasn't even in my notes. This is a bonus and it's free. So check this out. If you do the math, if you do the math, how many, how many angels rebelled with Satan against God? One third. And then Hebrew says that angels are ministering spirits to us. So that means two thirds remain with God. You know what that means, right? That for every demon that comes against you, there are two angels standing guard for you. The odds are in your favor. Stop thinking that the odds are against you. The odds are in your favor. God is with you. His angels are ministering spirits to you. You're going to overcome. You're going to make it out of this. But focus on the right thing. Stop focusing on your problem. Stop speaking about your problem. Speak to your problem. And tell your problem about God. And rise up in the name of Jesus to become victorious. Number three. Reflect on your previous victory. What you're going through now, yeah, it's difficult. What you're facing now may be overwhelming. But you've been here before. Maybe not fighting the exact same adversary. Maybe not going through the exact same sickness. Maybe, maybe it, it's a different problem. But, the, but the, the premise is the same. The God that healed you before is going to heal you today. The God that delivered you before can still do it today. Your breakthrough many moons ago is a reminder that God has a breakthrough for you today. As King Saul could have denied permission to David to fight Goliath. He could have said, no, you're not going to fight him. After all, there was a lot at stake. Remember, the entire nation. It wasn't just David's neck on the line. It was the entire nation at stake. And so to convince Saul, David referenced his previous victories. Not to brag, but to establish truth. Look at this, verse 34 to 37. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine. I love this. You know, if I could defeat the lion, I could defeat the bear. I'll take down this animal too. 
For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. But I want you to notice that last verse. He repeats a common theme. The Lord who rescued me. The Lord who rescued me. David didn't say, I can do it on my own. No, instead he noted that God had been on his side in the past so that he could trust, trust God to do it again. Did you know that sometimes the key to your breakthrough is simply a good memory? Sometimes it's just about having a good memory. And, and if you're like me, you don't have a good memory, hey, begin some sort of like victory journal. You know, get a calendar, get a journal. And every time you hit a milestone and every time God takes you to a place of victory, write it down, jot it down. Because it'll come in handy in your, in, in your valleys, in your storms, in your, in your dark seasons in life. You can pull out that journal and just be, just, just be uh, you know, encouraged by what you read there. You'll, be, you'll remember what God has done before and you'll be encouraged to believe that God can do it again. Why? Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he did it yesterday, he can do it today. He'll do it again tomorrow. Number four, remember who you represent. Remember who you represent. You remember we're talking about how to, how to fight giants. David's words to the giant were, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. What a difference it would make if we faced our challenges this way every time. Lord, it's your reputation, it's your honor and glory that are at stake here. This is less about me and it's more about you. When you realize that you are created for the glory of God, you are created to worship the living God, you are created in his image, listen, you understand that this is less about you and more about God's reputation, God's namesake. And it's okay to bring it up in prayer and it's okay to confront God with it. And say, hey, hey, God, I need your help because this is not just me at stake. This is, this is your reputation. This is your name because, after all, I'm your child. What would it say of me if I left my children unprotected? If my children were homeless? If my children uh, uh, were malnutrition? It would, speak, it would speak terribly about their father. And you need to understand that God cares about his reputation. Oftentimes in the Bible, he fights for his reputation. And God cares about that. You need to remember who you represent. Earlier we mentioned those unbelieving spies who came to Moses with, uh, with uh, you know, that bad report after exploring the promised land and finding that there were giants living in the city of Gath. Another interesting thing about this story is that God was so irritated by the uh, disbelief of the people that he offered Moses a fresh start. He was like, Moses... You know, how much more of this am I going to take? My people continue to, to, to lack belief, and I promise, and I, and I pull through. I, I opened the Red Sea. I sent a covering. A, 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 I sent a cloud by day and a pillar by night. I made water gush out of the rock. I made manna fall from heaven. Like, I, I've done all these signs and wonders, and they still don't believe and I'm really bothered by it. And he offers Moses a fresh start. Look at Numbers 14, verse 12. He says, if you want to, if you give me permission, Moses, I will disown them and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. Imagine this. This is, this is a good deal for Moses. He's like, Moses, I know they've given you headaches. I know that they threatened to stone you. That like, you want to get these people, you know, you want to get this headache off of you. I'll annihilate them right now, and I'll give you a new nation, more powerful, more generous, more respectful, more faithful, more believing, and I'm going to raise you up, and you're going to conquer the promise. You're going to conquer the greatest victories. I'll do this for you, Moses. The idea actually benefited Moses, but Moses would not ignore who he represented. Again, this was less about Moses and more about God's reputation. Look at verse 15 and 16, Numbers 14. Now, if you slaughter all these people with a single blow, the nations that have heard of your fame will say, the Lord was not able to bring them into the land he swore to give them, so he killed them 
in the wilderness. In other words, Moses is telling God, God, yeah, you can kill him, and I'd be good. But what about your name? This wouldn't look well on you. And the pagan nations that saw how you delivered us through and how you brought us through, they're going to say, in the end, he could not deliver the promise. In the end, he could not usher them into the land flowing with milk and honey. And Moses didn't want God's name to be tarnished, and neither did David. When David pointed out the fact that Goliath was uncircumcised, he was pointing out the fact that no Philistine had a covenant with God. This goes back to Abraham. Remember when God established a covenant with Abraham? And he said, this is the sign of the covenant. He said, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be the most blessed nation on the earth. And everybody who blesses you will be blessed. And everybody who curses you will be cursed. And he says, and here's a sign of the covenant that I established with you. All males of the Jewish lineage will be circumcised. And so when David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? At first, I got it twisted. And I was like, okay, TMI, David. I didn't have to know that. Too much information. I don't care if he's circumcised or not. But in reality, David is trying to tell us something. He's saying, the reason I dare to believe that I can defeat him is because he's uncircumcised. In other words, he has no covenant with God. I have a covering. I have a covenant. I have a protection. He's a giant, but he's got God against him. I'm small, but God is with me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? Sometimes you got to remember who you have come into covenant with. Sometimes you just have to remember who you represent, whose name is at stake, and it's not yours. Don't flatter yourself. It's his. It's his name that's at stake. I have a theory. I have this crazy little theory that the more people you put on notice about your devotion to God, the less likely you are to end up in defeat. Because, because imagine this, if, if you were to be like a bold believer and, and just let everybody at the workplace know, I'm a child of God. Because, you know, we got camouflage Christians nowadays. You know that, right? Like, like people that, that, I remember when I was in, in, in uh, uh, as a youth pastor, I was a youth pastor in Wesico, and we used to go to uh, the high school, and we used to minister at the, uh, I forget what it was called, uh, Youth for Christ or something like that. It was, it was like a Bible study club that they had there, and they, They'd bring us in, and we, we'd be able to minister to young kids. But I always, since I was a youth pastor, I would explore, and I would just kind of observe everything because I was leading these type of kids. And I wanted to know what was in. I wanted to know the fads. I wanted to know what was, you know, uh, wh- wh- what were their passions like and stuff. So I, would, I was very observant. And I would always see uh, kids that I knew that were Christian because some of them were from my church. And they'd try to be Christians on the down low. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a Christian, but, I mean, I have to tell everybody. And I would see this scene, and this, this scene would make me laugh because there was kids that, they would, they would be there at uh, the, the cafeteria at times. You remember those trays that you used to get? And uh, uh, they would put their food there, and they'd, they'd come and sit down at the table, and they'd, you know, they'd kind of sit down and put their tray. And some of us grew up like old school. Your parents taught you to pray for your food. And remember that? And... Uh, like, I had, a, I had a grandma that really, like, bugged us about it. And she's like, if, if you don't pray for your food, watch out. It's going to create maggots. And they're going to eat you up on the inside. So bless that food in Jesus' name right now, son. And so we grew up with this trauma of, like, I cannot eat without praying for my food. But there's these camouflage Christians nowadays that they're like, okay, I know I need to pray. But how am I going to pull this off? You know, they got their tray here. I got my tray here. I need to pull this off and so they'll get the napkin and they kind of like just drop it. And it's, it seems like it was an accident, but they'll be like, bless this food, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> Can I suggest to you that we need to be bold about our witness? The more, the more people, the more amount of people that know that you are a child of God, the less likely you, you are to end up in defeat before them. If your neighbors know that you're a child of God, this is just my theory. This is a crazy theory deduced from what we're talking about right here. If your neighbors know that you're a child of God, guess what? God's God's not going to let the bank repossess your home because how would he look? If the people at your workplace know that you're a child of God, God's not going to give them the luxury of seeing you in defeat because how would he look? The more people you put on notice about your relationship with Christ, about your devotion to God, the more people before whom God needs to defend his namesake. 
So can I encourage you, become a bold believer, become a powerful witness, bring people to church, announce publicly your devotion to God, don't be afraid. I know we live in a time where everybody's got to be politically correct, but you know what, put that aside for a moment and say, hey, I'd rather, I'd rather be a friend of God before anybody else. I'd rather be, I, you know, I feel sometimes we, we, ha, we get so caught up on pleasing other people that we have offended God. We have offended God trying not to offend other people. Sometimes you just, the, the Bible says that the, the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Sometimes you got to be forceful about your witness. Number five. And we'll close as the worship team comes up. Run toward your giants. Not away from them. Run towards your problems. Not away from them. Whatever the nature of your uh, problems. They might be family problems. Workplace problems. Financial. Emotional. Or whatever. When you can't figure out the answers. You may worry. You may get anxious. Or lose sleep. But how do you overcome that? One thing you can do is ignore the problem. One thing you cannot do is pretend that it's not there. If you were watching from the hill... That day of the battle between David and Goliath, this is what you would have seen, 1 Samuel 17, 48 to 49. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. Now check this out. This is interesting. The Bible says that as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Can you imagine this scene? You're seeing this huge giant and this little boy. And when the giant takes the first step, David knows, okay, it's on. He doesn't run away from the giant. He runs towards the giant. And there's, th this wasn't bravado. This wasn't David saying, oh, I can do this on my own. No, no, this was strategy. See, David knew the range of his sling, and he knew he needed to come into range in order for his weapon to be effective. You know what was going down here? David said, if I'm going to fight this giant, I'm going to fight him on my terms. And so I'm going to run within a slingshot's range where I can be most effective. And the Bible says that David launched that stone out of his slingshot. Now, let me tell you something. No doubt, no doubt David was a marksman. He had, he had a, a, a practice. He had perfected his craft. But, but I am convinced, because there's a, there's a detail there that I don't know if you noticed. The Bible says that when the stone sank in Goliath's forehead, Goliath fell face down. Now, when you fall face down, you fall face forward. Now, normally, the laws of inertia in physics will tell you that if a projectile hits you on the forehead, you're going to fall backwards. But the Bible says that Goliath fell face forward. I'm convinced, although David was a marksman, in the end I believe it was the power of the Spirit of God behind that stone because it was the faith of David that God was honoring. I am convinced that David could have thrown the stone that way and the Spirit would have put a curveball on that thing and it would have come back to the, to the giant's forehead because it is not by might, it is not by power, it is by my Spirit, says the Lord. So don't be afraid. Run towards your problems. Come into range. Bring them into range. Don't ignore them. He ran and stood over Goliath. He took the giant's own sword and cut off his head with it. I'm here to prophesy and tell you that after all it's said and done with, when you come out victorious, Satan and his allies will fear you more than you ever did them. The giants are coming against you to cause harm. I'm here to prophesy and declare that you're going to harm the kingdom of darkness more than the kingdom of darkness ever imagined they could harm you. He took his own sword. There's a, there's a, there's a prophetic illustration for somebody there. He took the giant's own sword to cut off his head. You're going through anxiety. You're going through depression. You're suffering insomnia. You're, whatever it is, I declare right now that the very weapon that the enemy used against you 
You're going to keep him up, him up at night now. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna strike terror into the kingdom of darkness. And the very thing that was meant to kill you and the very thing that was meant to destroy you is going to be your weapon. And you're going, to, you're going to bless others. You're going to inspire others. You're going to be compassionate. You're going to understand others because you've been in their shoes. You're not only going to have sympathy, you're going to have empathy. You know, symp sympathy is when you feel sorry for somebody. Empathy is when you identify with them. Hey, I feel bad for you, but I don't just feel bad for you. I know what you're going through because I've been there. That's empathy. And God is going to use the very thing that you're struggling against now to bring empathy towards others and compassion. And because you have overcome, I said this last week, I have this firm belief that when you overcome something, there's this anointing poured over your life against that very thing. And you're going to become a weapon in the hands of God to defeat the enemy and his schemes. If somebody believes it, I need to hear a shout. I need to hear an amen. I need to hear glory to God. If you keep reading the narrative, you'll find that when the men of Israel and Judah saw what David did, they were inspired and encouraged. They rose up, they chased the Philistines and defeated them soundly. They plundered the, the deserted Philistine camp and they walked away enriched. I believe that that's your destiny as well. You will walk away from this battle enriched. Others will rise up after you because you have given them hope. Let me close with this. Let me close with this. I mentioned this, this illustration before, but it's worth it. Totally worth it to repeat it. One of my favorite animals in the world is the honey badger. Somebody say the honey badger. It's a cute little animal. It's cute. It looks harmless. But it was voted by National Geographic the fiercest animal in the world. It used to be a very uh, dangerous, venomous snake that was considered the most lethal or the most fierce animal in the world. But somebody shot a video. There's a National Geographic video where the honey badger is facing off against this very snake. And it's, and it's incredible how the snake is, is first of all, like, you know, it's, it, it's almost like ceremoniously trying to, to lure in the honey badger and uh, almost kind of trying to hypnotize it. The honey badger, badger doesn't fall for it, and he's, he's very aware, and he's very alert. But in a given moment, in the middle of the struggle, the snake bites the honey badger. And this venom is so lethal, it can kill a human. And the honey badger begins to literally, you see it on the video, it, it begins to just swell up to the point that he can't keep his balance, and he kind of rolls over, feet up, and dies, literally dies. This snake has this ritual that he, uh, it, it, this, this snake begins to kind of like walk around or, or slither around its conquered prey. And uh, the narrator says, you know, uh, this is his victory parade. But as he's slithering around his prey, something begins to happen. Unbeknownst to the snake, something begins to happen on the inside of this honey badger. It's called the honey badger because it loves honey. And so all of its life, it's, it goes looking for honey. Now, where do you find honey? In the honeycomb. Who makes the honeycomb? Who makes the honey? The bees do. And so in order to get to the honey, the honey badger exposes himself literally to millions, millions of honey bee stings throughout his life. Every time he goes to get honey, he's being stung by all of these bees. What the honey badger does not know is that it's going to come in handy one day because when he is laid up, feet up against the snake and he is dead, all of those stings that he suffered, all of those little portions of, uh, of, of venom or whatever it is that, that bees inject when they, when they sting you, they have created an antidote in his body that is going to help him fight the venom of this vicious snake. And so all of a sudden, you begin to see the video, and the swelling comes down. And all of a sudden, he shakes it off, comes back to life, literally comes back to life, gets up. The snake is still ceremoniously prancing and slithering around his prey. He doesn't know what's going on. The badger catches it by surprise from behind the neck and rips his head off, literally rips his head off. And I'm here to tell you why do I love the honey badger, because I believe it illustrates something that you need to know this morning 
everything that you have ever been through in your life, every sting, every adversity, every problem, every sickness has prepared you for this moment, this moment where you feel you're hopeless, this moment where you feel that you're down and out. For David, it had been lions and bears. For David, it had been lions and bears. And he said, if I could defeat the lion and if I could defeat the bear, I'm going to defeat this giant too. For you, it might be, hey, all the stings of life. I've been through a lot, Pastor. You don't know what I've been through. But let me tell you, all of that has prepared you for this decisive moment. And I tell you, in the name of Jesus, rise up. Rise up. Understand that God has given you the victory over the vicious serpent. The one we know as Satan. You are more than a conqueror. You will strike him. You will defeat him. You will rise up. The power of God is in you. He has prepared you for such a time as this. Come on, let's worship the Lord. If you're ready to claim your victory, if you're ready to claim your good nights, I want you to come to this altar. If you're ready to believe that God has made you an overcomer, if you're ready to declare that the potential is already in you, if you're ready to believe that the power of God is going to be manifested in your life and that you're going to overcome your giants, I want you to come forward. I believe it in Jesus' name. I believe.